Well, the, the interesting Should thing... Should we be worried from... that China has propulsion technology we've never dreamed of? Do they have repulsors like Iron Man? Probably. <laughs> NASA has a budget for warp drive research. Hey, it's Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. Uh, welcome back to the laboratory for another another hang. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for coming over. <laughs> <laughs> and special thanks, as always, to our backers on Patreon, who throw us as little as a buck an episode to help keep this whole operation afloat. If you want to throw in over there, go to patreon.zengineeringpodcast.com. That's P A T R E O N dot engineering podcast dot com. So we're back. It's just me and Brian. What uh, what are we talking about? What are we talking about this week? We're talking about drones, baby. Uh, you mean aerial aerial drones? Not like, not just boring people. Not <laughs> 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 just Not worker bees. <laughs> no, we're talking about unmanned aerial vehicles, quadcopters, maybe maybe UFOs. I don't know. We'll see. Burrito delivery, important oh, things. Oh, damn. Warp drives. Warp drives. Warp drives. Yeah, um, definitely warp drives. We should, first, we forgot that we warp drives. Yeah, that'd be a completely different episode. That's, that's why this one will end maybe with we, warp drives. Maybe we shouldn't. We should just tease space propulsion. We'll do. Well, we can't talk propulsion. about drones without talking about UFOs. Yeah, but we should tease so, into it. We'll erase. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Look into the light as we erase those comments. <laughs> so first, first, uh, give me, give me science news. What's or what's something cool you learned since the last episode? Uh, oh yeah, let me let me. What did I have pulled up here? Uh, yeah. So I read a really interesting article yesterday. Everybody's talking about self-driving cars, self-driving vehicles. Everybody's waiting to see what happens. Google's got them. Tesla's got them. Volvo's work. Everybody's working on them now. But uh, a clock where... and hours on open roads so that they can say we have driven a hundred billion hours with no accident. Hooray! Right. <laughs> where are they actually being used yet? Where? Wait, that didn't. That grammar didn't feel right. Where? Where are they being used now? Yet where? Anyway, in actuality, in actuality. So this was an article about Uber, but not Uber cars. It's about Uber shipping, which uh, I actually hadn't heard anything about. Um, Uber, make- Uber doesn't make money off of the place where Uber is encountered by most people. <laughs> Probably um, not. They, their prices are so low and so much of that money goes back to the drivers that they have this crazy value. They're valued at being like worth $50 billion or something like that. And they don't make money. That's um, what most and, big companies like that look like when they start. Yeah. And their play all along, though, if you watch their sober, so like the company's behavior has been they're recording data to use for self-driving. And they are working on, they bought the shipping company, Otto, O-T-T-O. That's this one that you're talking about, which is. Uh, oh, that's right. I do. Commercial, I do remember. commercial applications for self-driving vehicles. Well, I remember the, the immediate lawsuits that followed between right. like Google's Waymo. Is that Google's yeah. self-driving? Yeah. Anyway, I thought this was interesting because they, they have trucking uh, using self-driving trucks right now in in industry, uh, and I just thought the the process was neat. It's an interesting application. So they've got. Well, think about it as a technical challenge. Like self-driving on a highway, it's generally pretty easy. Like it's it's, it's as really, straight it, as we yeah. can get it to be. It's really well marked. There's usually like a barrier on the side, and it usually has reflectors on it. If you hit a, a reflector with a laser. It goes, whoa, like you can see it. <laughs> you know? A little cartoon reflector, I had it. So, I it. so for like a, a Disney truck movie. that just needs to like stay in its lane, go a speed, make sure idiots don't hit it. That's a that's simple compared to the, out your, what you're probably imagining when you think of a self-driving car, right? Which is, I mean, you, Brian, like, can I get in this thing and can it shuttle me around San Diego? That's a right, way that's more hard. complicated task. 
I was just going in, San in the straight line on a highway. I was just in San Francisco driving around in cars, and it's terrifying. Like a real city, San Diego's a city, but it's it's not bustling quite like San Francisco, nor is it old like San Francisco. And it is a disaster driving around. I mean, it's just so, so complicated. There's so many weird streets and weird things and construction and bikes and mopeds and pedestrians and trolleys and shit. I don't know how you get the, a self-driving car to move around up there. What did the article say, though? Uh, it just talked about... Uh, so they have a self-driving fleet uh, in production in Arizona where they're testing some other self-driving stuff. And I just thought it was interesting how they're tackling it, right? So they've got... <clears throat> They have self-driving, like picture big 18 wheelers, like picking up those big, uh, big freight trucks, freight trailers. And they, uh, they drive point to point, but only like outside of surface streets. So like you were saying, the self-driving component only happens on freeways, highways, expressways, whatever you call them. A person drives your stuff to a depot. And at that depot, the self-driving trucks pick it up and they drive much easier, straighter lines, really long distances yep. to the big city depot. And then they drop it off and then some people pick it up. Yep. So kind of like big boats happen now. You ship across the ocean, you got a, a, a small crew and a captain, and then they get into port and little tugboats come around and move them around, right? right. Similar kind of like the little thing that hooks into an airplane and tugs it around the the tarmac a tow a towing gate <laughs> <laughs> um, so, funny it's just an interesting application yeah. it, was, it was interesting to hear that that's uh happening uh how they're approaching it right because the self-driving component of an 18 wheeler downtown seems horrifically dangerous uh and then the fact that there's still people in all of them <laughs> just the people just the trucks right. on the highway they're not the allowed person. to operate them without right. a safety without a safety a safety uh, officer or something i forget officer. the term they use but it was yeah. um, but it's um, happening it's a happening. The yeah, and are... we, I had there's another piece. This, this isn't what I had for my thing this week, but related. Uh, Tesla drove. Tesla used its electric semis to drive a delivery of batteries from their Reno plant to their Stockton like car factory, mm -hmm. like 275 miles or something. And both of those trucks are supposed to be able to go 500. So they could potentially on one charge from the big solar array in Reno, get all the way down to drop off the batteries and then come home. If they can generate enough solar at the Gigafactory to power up those trucks to drop off those batteries, it's worth having those electric trucks just for them. So if they do a production run and it doesn't turn out to be commercially successful, they go, ah, fuck it, bring them all back in. We'll use them. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a, a good backup use case. I doubt it'll pay off its R&D immediately. Because <laughs> they're going to need to keep shipping batteries. And then eventually they'll be way ahead on that tech because they've just been running that delivery route for the longest time. I don't think anyone's worrying about electric vehicles not taking off anymore. <laughs> I, think that, I think that ship has, uh, has fuel celled its way off. But you know what? You know what they should be worried about? the item for my thing, which is the question of whether or not you can use a cell phone on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. You see this one? Uh, some company is working on some sort of technology to make it so that you can get a 4G signal on the moon, basically. So you could have a cell phone that essentially functions uh, like our cell phones function when they're on 4G LTE, like in a city. But on the moon. Uh, why? I, I assume the way you pitch that sincerely <laughs> is so that we can communicate with rovers and things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Devices as but we... But comically, the presentation is, so I can use my cell phone on the moon. <laughs> I mean, if I were on the moon, I'm pretty sure I would. there would be applications where I'd want to open my phone and look something up. So, reasonable. <laughs> There's nowhere. There's so nowhere in the universe. So we can just have Wikipedia on the moon. <laughs> and you can just go, there's a rock here. It's brown. It seems like a localized hub with, with a few main websites cached that like the probably. spaceship brings with it is probably the right first move. Updates occasionally. Well, I want my data on the moon. So I'm paying extra to keep it on a hard drive in cold storage on the moon. <laughs> it seems like line of sight would be pretty good most places. 
Yeah, probably. Just some kind of laser relay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what kind of uh, depth you get into craters on the moon. I don't know how you pull that off, but... I've only been on the moon once. I don't remember. Anyway, that was a funny idea. Just like the last time we did this, I feel like it was way shorter than yours. Okay, so drones. Okay, so, like, what's your average, you know... What do we mean when we say drone? Uh, well, I'm picturing the little device. Oh, I actually have two of them in my office. Yeah, it's right. Th- it's right. Oh, right. I just pointed like everyone can see it <laughs> right there on our video right chat. It's behind you, hanging on the wall. Uh, I was talking little quadcopters, the little four propeller, little helicoptery devices right. that people are that you see nerds flying around wherever you go. I have been stunningly, for my curiosity and and about all things tech, have been remarkably bored by the notion of drones. I so didn't... far, like I just kind of go, oh, yeah, I get it. But I've been playing with like remote control cars and shit since I was a kid. So I feel like I should be interested. Is it just that I haven't played with the right one? Or is it just like, eh, it's, well, now it's flying around in this park, but what do I do? No, I, I was I was surprised too. I got really into quadcopters like, gosh, I guess it was four or five years ago now. It was before and they really took one. off. And I built one and I was really excited. And I spent all this time learning about the parts and the tech and I built it and I wrote some software and stuff. And then I, then I flew it a couple of times and I was, I was bored. I don't know what you do once you fly it. <laughs> I'm not like you, interested you also, in being a pilot. You also broke it frequently. It did break. Uh, they don't fly as well when you build them yourself, especially like five or six years ago. <laughs> um, but the commercial ones are super stable now to the point that they just fly themselves sometimes and follow you around. That was that was what I wanted to do was build one that would follow me while I was surfing. Uh, but at the time, that was too much, too much hobby time invested for me to get get that off the ground. There are two devices I can think of that solve problems that you have while you're surfing already based on GPS and like wristbands that you could wear while you're surfing. Uh, There's a drone that'll follow you. Although battery time while you're on the water is an issue. You better catch a wave within 20 minutes. (laughs) And there's a follow camera rig where you can set up just a video camera on a tripod that will follow you with a telephoto lens cool um yeah from that a distance. All been solved now yeah i mean there's footage of people snowboarding and stuff with a drone following them now so incredible crazy uh so let's back it up to like how how does that uh quadcopter function like mechan- like why this explosion i vaguely remember people having remote controlled planes there we go yeah, like let's on go tv back. and stuff like when i was time. a kid but you had to like, I, th- I think they literally ran on like gas engines. <laughs> Some of them did. But you could fly them around with a remote control from the ground. Man, the planes, the planes have always been really they were cool. Big and they just kind of looked like biplanes, and piloting them was uh, an art for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like flying. It's like flying real devices, except they're much more, much more difficult. I think, in in some some ways, they're much more difficult. Uh, yeah, I mean, this stuff has always been around, right? When we were kids, there were, uh, little RC cars, radio controlled cars is what the RC stands for. Uh, there were, there were planes, there were helicopters. I mean, all the things, whatever you can picture, right. That we drive around in big people had in little, uh, I remember my brother had an RC car. Um, it was like a monster truck kind of little thing. It was, it was the best. You just drive it around and run it into things and make it do flips and stuff. Uh, they were interesting issue with them even when we were kids right the uh they were expensive as toys first of all they broke easily because you can make them go really fast and flip them off things and then they'd smash and parts fall apart uh and they ran on batteries usually i think which mean, meant you could only play with them for like 15 minutes and then you had to charge a battery for four hours <laughs> <laughs> i would more frequently break a motor than i uh would worry about the battery but the battery is also heavy which makes the whole thing very awkward because now we have light enough batteries that think like, you make drones that can just bounce off things and it's kind of not a big deal because they can be spongy enough spongy but what changed that got us to or i guess 
like what I think is interesting to follow there is when you when you look at it, you think, okay, the first thing we did was we made just a car. We were familiar with the mechanical sort of function of the machine that is a a car. And then we squashed it down and then we went, hey, at this size, if we give it really big tires that stick out on both sides, <laughs> now it can land upside down and oh, run just fine. Awesome. What was that? Huh. Okay. That's brilliant. What? That was when they were, that's when the little RC cars became popular standard toys that you get at like Toys R Us and Radio Yeah, they just bumper cars for the world around you. <laughs> But there are still Boston Dynamics robots that work on that same premise. I saw a video the other day of this little jumper one that can jump like 25 meters in the air or something oh, like that. Man. And basically, it's built around the idea that if the wheels are big enough, you can just land any which way and, and run away <laughs> as long as you can reorient yourself. Uh, so, but planes like flying stuff. So we tracked with planes for a while and we just sort of made those planes and they were hard to deal with. But then we, we got to helicopters. I mean, you see helicopters in the, in the world, right? How come a remote controlled helicopter was never cool enough to catch on? Right. Like, what, I wonder they why it did. And they always broke immediately. And I feel like the I, I feel like there are a couple of things going on with quadcopters. One, I think there's some there's some uh tech and software and processing that I think was needed that wasn't necess- that isn't needed in the planes and the helicopters, right? Cuz the the helicopter is a mystery to me, right? Cuz the the helicopter is kind of the same thing. Um so I'm wondering I think the answer is it's just really hard to fly a helicopter. It, uh, it might I think be helicopter might be pilots are skilled as fuck. They certainly are. <laughs> Helicopter pilots are using all four limbs to like control their vehicle at all times. Uh, I think the reality of how a helicopter functions is really effective for the scale at which a helicopter needs to function in the real world. When you shrink that down, the just the physics of that that machine, which is essentially this one rotor pulling one way while the other rotor pulls sideways so that it's stabilized, like the tail rotor. I think that just gets so hard to maneuver at a smaller scale that just uh, my memory of every remote controlled helicopter I've ever seen is like, there are some that look really cool and they're big and you can use them out in the open. But the ones at the RC level, like the cars where you could just buy it at Toys R Us or whatever, they immediately ran into things and broke. And then it was just like, fuck, never fixing that. That's how I picture Uh, all of these things, right? (laughs) RC cars, I looked and broke a lot of them. RC planes. Again, I kind of like built a bunch. I don't think I ever got them to the point that they were RC flyable. But when I would go to, you can go to like parks and stuff where people gather to fly their RC planes and shoot off like those rockets and stuff. Uh, And uh, those are usually like full on day events, right? People pull up in their pickup truck, the back of it's full of parts parts and controllers and backups and other planes and uh those are people who are like really passionate about uh flight and and they're like ex-pilots or people who are engineers who used to work for aerospace companies and these are complicated things right like i've seen people who have actual jet engines on their rc planes Uh, I've seen these take off and it's like a miniature fighter jet. I mean, it sounds like it. It's a real jet engine. It functions just like it. And it's expensive. It's complicated. It's, it's hard to fly. A plane's really hard to fly. I mean, you got to know how to fly one. When you, so when you talk about a jet engine, that's, you know, scaled down like that and how impressive it is. That's somebody who as a hacker has been focusing on miniaturization (laughs) There are, there's also a whole subset of people that take that in a direction, which is just like, okay, what I actually want to do with this is carry a camera. So how can I make the experience of the miniature helicopter more stable and just easier to manage? And the thing is, at that scale, you can do things that aren't aren't doable at that higher level, like the big wheels that I was talking about. So... Like a, a practical, like a quadcopter, the size of the helicopter everyone is imagining right now <laughs> is just so loud and destructive that it's not, it's not 
you know, Are like, you talking about a full those, size quadcopter that like a human yeah, can ride? Yeah, like in? those hellish ships that they have in in the Marvel movies <laughs> are a ridiculous. terrible idea. Those that rotor technology is would just everything. If it was as close to the ground as they show it there occasionally, just all housing in that area would be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure you can loud fast enough to uh to right tell something like that at that scale yeah at that scale down right. at the, but down at the rc scale a quadcopter works so that's what we came up with was if you put four rotors on either side but then part of how you pull that off is via the flight controller chip you explained that to me once when you were building your your drone so like so what did they do Right, like the flight controller essentially offloads a bunch of the stuff a human would have to think about with all four of those rotors to a computer, but then uses a way of stabilizing something in the air that's the best we've found so yeah, far. Yeah, that's where I've that's where I've stable wondered. shit. <laughs> I, I know uh, the same flight controller that's on the quadcopter I built can be used for an RC plane and an RC helicopter, so. There's there's software on there. There there's always been uh, intelligent software as a big part of this, and I assume some of the sensors are on there, but um, I don't really know. I don't really know where where the the tech changed pace. But I think what happened is essentially we someone came up with an idea that seems a lot cooler than a regular helicopter, uh, and it also happened to coincide with uh, much lower prices for for parts here, right? You've got all this enabled uh, manufacturing overseas uh, that makes these miniaturized RC components just way cheaper than they used to be in like the eighties and nineties. Um, and so, so why talk to me about why the quadcopter design is uh, achieves this, right? Cause you have four, cause it doesn't work with three rotors. I mean, it, uh, it, it does. does, but they're most ex- mostly experimental cases. At two rotors, it looks like a helicopter. That's the only way we found to pull it off with two rotors, right? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think through. Uh, Maybe three, but at four, it gets pretty easy to have this thing that four is, is a good balance you can... for a handful of reasons. I don't have a great explanation of like the physics of why a quadcopter is like a stable device to be playing with, but. Um, four rotors make sense because you have to deal with the same issue on a quadcopter that you have to deal with on a helicopter, which you touched Up, on a second down, ago. Forward, back, left, right, pitch, yaw. Like there's all these things you need to know about where you are in three dimensional space in order to not fall out of the sky and also go the direction that right. you want to go. It just four is the minimum number where it, it's like, oh, that's real easy for a computer to see what's happening in time and space and whatever and react to it and then dumb that down to where a human can can click on a button and go go forward and it goes okay and compensates for its environment as it tries to achieve the objective that you're you're giving it via the remote control yeah, the, you can uh, also have six rotor things eight rotor things 12 rotor things that you can have they make drones to carry want. big big ass cameras that you you know fly around and stuff now for like hollywood productions okay so the 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 conversation about drones is funny now because we take for granted i feel like a piece of it that's like a remarkable thing (laughs) to understand which is how to make shit fly i think we i think we take everything (laughs) as soon as there's like a cell phone remote area um, I think we take everything for granted. We're just like, oh, well, it's got a smartphone, so of course it can fly around. Uh, and and we don't necessarily stop to think that's of- largely true because if you have the smartphone and the drone and like GPS access, this is a problem you can solve. In fact, this is a really interesting angle to talk about at some point in this conversation, which is like there's a lot of interesting drone innovation happening, like in like sub-Saharan Africa, like places where you can leapfrog certain things. Like there are places in Africa that have better uh, like blood transfusion delivery systems than we have in the U.S. because we drive it via ambulance. Uh, There are places where there just weren't roads and there weren't going to be roads, but there's no reason we can't use drones to serve them. And so there are drone 
systems that deliver like organ transplants to African cities great. really effectively. Drones are drones seem like a fantastic way to deliver stuff. It's uh it's it's somewhat surprising um, that we aren't using them for more things like that. But back to the back to the the physics problem of lift, right? <laughs> Is that how far back you want to go? I think so. I think it's interesting to start. <laughs> Bernoulli's principle. If we want to, if we want to do some some, uh, if we want to do some uh, some tech talk here, I think we should go through kind of the components of of a quad and how it works. Okay, so uh, not to take it all the way back to 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 basic physics, uh, a wing works by creating a force called lift that you know carries an object upward uh in in our atmosphere <laughs> right um, and the the propeller does it does that by pushing air in a direction we're talking about propellers right yeah. so that's essentially the same the same idea as a wing which like lifts a plane except you keep the object stationary and you spin the wing to create the force that you need to you know, push you in a direction in the atmosphere. Every form of propulsion we have, at least in the air, is just that. How can you push some air around to make another thing happen? Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting uh, component of flight that uh, is surprising when you first learn about it, right? Because we have paper airplanes, right? Everybody's made a paper airplane and flown it. And you're just talking like a piece of a flat piece of paper kind of in the general structure of a plane. Uh, and it, it works, right? You can make some pretty cool paper airplanes that cruise around uh, and go in circles and do loop, loop the loops. Is that is that how that phrase? Oop de loops. Loop de loops. Loop de loops. Loop 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 <laughs> um, but in in like a plane that you've been on that you've flown in, there's a totally different principle at work. It's kind of what you think. You're still propelling something through the air like you do when you throw a paper airplane. But there's a there's a particular shape to the wing. Uh, and and we essentially we took this from nature, right? Birds have wings that are, are shaped this way. And based on the shape of the wing, it, it as it moves through the air, it creates a pressure differential. And so above the wing, low pressure, like you said, below the wing, standard atmospheric pressure and so part of a plane flying is the fact that the atmosphere is pressing it up into the air and it's carrying it around. Um, and it, and it's, it's something we had to really discover and perfect. If you look at uh, early flight operations, early flight tests, everybody was like using flat wings. I mean, I picture there's like a classic video. It's like that stop motion. You can like tell it's it's like early Charlie Chaplin style stuff. And it's it's a dude with like wings strapped to his arms, jumping off a cliff and flapping his arms. <laughs> Which is there's 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 something there, right? You get a force. If you just flap your arms, you can feel the force of the atmosphere. But at that point we had no reason to believe that was impossible other than it just doesn't seem to work. Every it's there's certainly you're certainly taught as a kid that everyone thought flight was impossible. I doubt that was actually Now we have people mindset. that wear wingsuits and fly around <laughs> shit. Um so yeah, I mean a quadcopter is essentially doing a helicopter or anything with blades like that is essentially doing similar to what a, an airplane does. It's just creating that forward propulsion for the wing uh, by spinning a blade really fast. It's basically spinning a little wing really quickly and it creates lift. And part of how helicopters work, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting progression because we figured out the rotor idea in order to pull. I mean, we've always had fans. How long have, <laughs> did, when did when was the table fan invented? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a really good question. Could have been after helicopters. Who knows? <laughs> um, but helicopters have progressed because if you do it that way with the the propeller, you have essentially a different profile of of lift of control over whatever you're trying to do. Which is why you don't see helicopters that are big long tubes with a lot of people in them like airplanes because they're the helicopters are more maneuverable because they hover essentially. Um, 
but they're not really good for like packing 400 people in and carting them across the ocean. Yeah, I would guess the energy efficiency is a lot lower on a helicopter. Um, and especially, and the trade off is control. Sorry. And the trade off is control though. Yeah. Right. right. You get all this maneuverability. You can hover, you can't hover in a, in an airplane, right? It it's, it's wing. Essentially it's rotor blade is fixed and just not without somehow forward. combining these two. Yeah. Right. I mean, it would not without somehow, I mean, all this stuff is minutely manipulable now, right? Like a helicopter works because we have the machinery to tilt the rotor forward just a tiny bit. So, Hey, let's put some of that thrust forward. Boom, right, off right, we go. Right. The whole thing dips forward and then takes off. Yeah, and they're they're cool. hybrids, right? I mean, the military, uh, I want to say the Navy, maybe everyone's using it, has something called the Osprey, which is a propeller plane that ha- it can turn its propellers and take off and land like a helicopter, um, which is pretty cool. You see those out here in, in on the West Coast a lot, cruising up and down. They have a bunch up at Pendleton, I think. But uh, so there's like hybrid stuff going on. That's that's a two a two bladed helicopter, and we have huge lift helicopters. You can look up you can look up some really neat uh, helicopters online that pick up some big <laughs> ass stuff. There's some there's some big like military transport helicopters. They probably use these in industry too, but they can hoist up tanks and stuff, which is that's a that's a big right. freaking thing to be lifting up. So yeah, um, so the uh, there's probably physical limits with the sizes it can be, but uh, generally speaking, the uh, the helicopter lift I like to kind of an easy way to think of it is it kind of just presses down on the air, right? You spin the spin the blades, it's blowing. It's like a fan, like you said. Um, and part of how we're able to effectively control that essentially like power that we're generating is by offloading certain aspects of the minute control of that system in order to achieve whatever we're trying to do to computers. Um, so a lot of this advancement tracks really closely with, uh, communication advances, which I feel like are the things we talk about on here most often. Like the part of the thing to understand with this is like, if we, if you have an accelerometer in your phone and a GPS system that can tell your phone where it is in space so you can get, you know, radio signal essentially. And you know, like visit where, where it is in three dimensional space, I guess Mm -hmm. that same sensor is real helpful on a helicopter. So the, the reason we have helicopters is because we needed stuff. To, we wanted stuff to fly, but we needed better than we could do with just a plane, which was like move a bunch of stuff really fast, but like mostly in a straight line, because you can only deviate so wildly without it getting really like fighter jet fighter pilots are you know skilled. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that they're pretty good at what they do, uh, and it's probably pretty difficult. But you can't, uh, helicopters just let you do stuff in a smaller area, right? You can just take off the ground. You need an area that's large enough for the helicopter to fit, to land it, for instance. But a plane, you need a runway, right? That's a big deal. So I think most of the stuff probably pioneered, for the most part, by the military. Uh, and so, helicopters are just, so, they're maneuverable, right? You can turn around. You can turn around in the physical space of the helicopter, whereas yeah, a fighter jet fly. needs like miles to turn right. around. You can't fly a plane in a city. You can you can fly a helicopter between buildings in a large city. Um, so, but then how do we get from that down to the RC side and the quadcopters, right? At, at the scale of a quadcopter, this is kind of where I was going before, you can, you can use a different, like, means of achieving that sort of physical, get a thing in the air, control it, take it places... In the case of a helicopter, you know, set it back down again yeah. gently. Yeah, so I don't I don't think you could have built a quadcopter uh at like the miniature scale and the miniature cost that we have them now, uh like ten or twenty years ago, really. Because the heli RC helicopters actually have all of the mechanics of a helicopter where like the blades can be uh, pitched forward and backwards and and moved at angles and stuff. So it has a lot of extra mechanics. Whereas a quadcopter is just four fixed blades on on a physical body, on like a thing <laughs> that holds right. the four blades, that's, right? 
I feel like that's the piece of it, right? You can make a helicopter function, but you need to have all the machinery in place to like it's, be yeah. able to pitch the rotors forward. At a small scale, that stuff gets fragile. Right. Not worth trying to and do anymore. And it's just mechanically complicated, right? It's lots of extra parts. Right. Quadcopters don't tilt the rotors. They just allocate power to the motors, yep. the electric motors running the rotors to make the same thing happen. Because if you have four rotors and you decrease power from the the you know front right one, the whole thing is going to dip right. and then they get pulled anyway. So by just moving the propeller in space... Yeah, and so I, I, I think uh, that to do that, right, to just have this it, mechanically, it's much, it's much simpler than a, a helicopter. Um, I mean, literally, strap four motors to anything, <laughs> right? A, a board. Who cares? The the whole structure here is you've got what you were talking about earlier, the flight controller, which we've essentially offloaded all the complexity of the mechanical system in the helicopter um, onto the flight controller with the quadcopter, right? And you're just bolting four motors to something. And then that flight controller has all these sensors on it that give it information and allows it to calculate, hey, how do I keep this stable? And then how do I go places when the pilot gives me instructions? Uh, which which helicopters had that RC helicopter had stuff too. Uh, but it's a different it's a different situation going on now with a quadcopter. And it's interesting because it's an, it's another one of these cases where real world mechanical systems are the complexity has been reduced and offloaded to computation to software to little chips on a board that are also attached to the quadcopter and as soon as that happens you have this it's it an explosion of capacity to once it's offloaded to software you can just make it you can make it you can stream you can you can improve how that system functions like on an ongoing basis instead of every time it's worth replacing that iteration that costs a lot of money to have or rebuild or whatever so if like the magic of the quadcopter design is we've now come to a place where that flight controller is mostly in control mm -hmm. and the instructions that you give it are controlled by computers that we can say, uh, do it differently next time. Uh, change the way you want to do it a little bit the next time you do it. And you can start applying the machine learning stuff we've talked about in the in our previous episodes to solving that problem of maintaining whatever in physical space. And they all learn from one another about how to do it, especially in the hacker community where they're just passing controller software around. Yeah, the uh, the quad that I built a while ago uh, just used open source software. So uh, it was, <clears throat> I mean, the board is tiny, right? It fits in the palm of your hand and it looks like an electronics board that you'd see in anything. Uh, it's got a bunch of stuff on it. It's got a bunch of connectors where you connect the, the motor controllers, essentially where you connect the motors. Uh, you connect like the radio controlled transmitter uh, or transceiver that you, can tr that you can communicate with your remote control. Uh, and then it's just got, the basic sensors it's got uh i had gps on it it's got accelerometers it's got altimeter uh it's got a magnetometer and then uh it has all this intelligence right i just i would download the latest software that was stable for that uh that project that ran on that board and i had all of this intelligence available it just synced up with um uh, my quad and my controllers and my motor controllers and the really interesting part was that the software compensated for the physical design of the quadcopter and so all i had to tell it was that i had four motors or four rotors and it didn't need to know like the size of the quadcopter or its weight or its dimensions or how the blades were related to each other it would just kind of sense that as it was flying and the software would adjust how it controlled itself and so it wasn't exactly machine learning I, I, by the classic definition, but it kind of is. It was kind of an, it's like an intelligent machine. It's, it knows all it's, this stuff. It's not machine learning in that sense because it doesn't, it's not like you could then, it's not like you would take your quadcopter out of San Diego and then it would struggle for a little while to learn how it is in another place. Cause every time it's just spinning up a loop of, okay, 
resistance here respond this way in order to make this sensor feel flat relative to the horizon, right? Or whatever. Like it's doing that in a loop, but that flight controller contains intelligence about how to do that, that it's looping through every time. The thing about machine learning is we can have a feedback loop where you could potentially have a drone that's like really good in San Diego, but you fly to Seattle and it's shit because the environment's different for like three weeks until like a child, you know, like a child, it's rewritten its software to be like, okay, I know how things are around here. That's not really how it works with quadcopters, but that's what like where machine learning would apply. Instead, they just keep increasing the intelligence of that onboard chip that that goes. Uh, hey, that's a that's a that's a a tree. I should go around it. That's a lamppost. I should go around it. Yeah, I was. Those are power lines. I should come nowhere within fifty meters. Like, I was really amazed when I got uh, a flight controller for my first quadcopter, uh, my only quadcopter. Um, that it just had so much stuff built in already again this was like five or six years ago before this was before there were like these big companies that are selling quadcopters everywhere now and the board already had everything i mean i could hook up camera gimbals and get uh three degrees of freedom on a on a camera that you could attach and you just buy all these components and the stuff was not expensive like the flight board was 22 dollars i mean it was, that was five years ago it was dirt what cheap. you have hanging on your wall back there you can just go buy for 25 bucks. You know, this it'll be, you know, yeah, you can, uh, you can buy a, a four tiny inches by sure. four very, inches, very right? It'll be a novelty drone, but it'll fly around your office and bump into things. And it'll probably fly <laughs> a lot better now too. That one really yeah. struggled. <laughs> and I'm curious um, how much that was just software, right? If I updated that software uh, to whatever the newest version is, maybe it would yeah. crash. I also had cheap um, components, so like motors would just stop. And if a motor just stops mid-flight, you're done. <laughs> it crashes yeah, hard. Right. <laughs> motor dies. It just you're falls not, out of the you're sky. Not gliding it into the ground. So, so once you have that level of control and that level of aware of awareness, you're starting to get into that droid space where, like, you know, people are sad when R two D two gets hurt in the movies. <laughs> BB-8 looks sad, which is you know a thing that happens. <laughs> it's a great accomplishment to make make those little robots look sad. So we're getting we're catching up to like Back to the Future two, you know, burrito delivery drones. Yeah, no? I, mean, I mean we've got the, the drones you can go buy now, uh, or even the drones you've been able to buy for three or four years from big big uh, drone robotics companies. <clears throat> they're fully controllable just from like a laptop, right? You just put in, you just tell it where you want it to go. Um, you might have to map out, uh, you might have to map out flight, like flight paths for it too. It might, I don't know if, I don't know if you can just tell it to like fly from here down to the beach and take some pictures and come back. And if it'll navigate itself, it might run into things. Um, but uh, it's, it's, they're self-contained, right? They're GPS. You can tell it, go to this GPS location and go land and it'll just do it all on its own. Uh, and that's currently available can... to just people for hundreds of right. a few hundred dollars. Well, and that means for a few thousand, there are things available. I've, I've seen a demo of one already that just has 14 cameras on it, maybe more. And at enough points of like attention that they can just drive through forests with you while you ride your bike and they don't run into things. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's interesting watching them go. Cause they kind of go oh, a thing and they back up and they go Zoom, and then they catch up and then, you know, an object avoidance, but it's a thing that's happening. It sounds so, like the chase in return of the Jedi where they're driving right. through and they kind of sound like that too. <laughs> like the buzzing bees. Yeah. <laughs> so, we we promised up front we were going to talk about UFOs and <laughs> so the intermediate piece to cover here that I don't want to dwell on in part because it's a bummer is the understanding that all of this stuff that like we figured out for cell phones, the magnetometers, the accelerometers, all that kind of stuff, like we're also using on everything else up the chain that we just talked about in terms of what we understood. So once you have that kind of device it's like now you can put it in a helicopter now you can make a helicopter at the smallest scale that you can like building a thing big enough to put people in it is a big hassle 
<laughs> but once it's there's, there's a gradient of scale between these things that we've been talking about. So at the same time, you, you, you know, the military is working on technology to do weird, weird, you know, stuff. Right. So <laughs> like, I would hope so. When you start to talk about UFOs and like the idea of like unmanned aerial vehicles, like now we're talking about like was spinning UFOs. Like what, what, where, where's, where do we go from here? That's <laughs> well, the, the interesting should we thing be worried we... that China has propulsion technology. We've never dreamed of. Do they have repulsors like Iron Man? Probably. <laughs> Probably. I think we definitely should be thinking about this stuff, right? It's, I mean, there are, there's technological advancement in the sense that like, uh, in the common sense that we see every day, like our smartphones get a little better, right? The cameras are getting better. I mean, even in the smartphone was like revolutionary, right? But it's, it's what allowed the smartphone to be revolutionary was the miniaturization of technology we've been working on for decades. And then a really beautiful user interface, uh, a touchscreen technology that we kind of iterated and iterated and iterated until it was, was like perfect. Um, but what didn't allow the smartphone necessarily uh, was like a mind blowing new discovery in physics. Uh, and that's on the order of like nuclear weapons, right? That was the, that was the, activation of scientific discovery that allowed us to literally unleash something that was unimaginable before that because we understood at the depths of science something new that we had never tackled as an engineering project before and when you start to talk about ufos and space travel and uh different types of earth-based flight propulsion you start to touch on a space where you're talking about theoretical physics then right they're there's the concept of uh, vehicles that can fly in Earth's atmosphere, not because they're pressing off of air, but because they're manipulating gravitation, which we don't know how to do. We don't know how to do that yet, but it's doable. It's doable mathematically. Um, but as far as we know, it's only doable mathematically if you put a bunch of mass somewhere. And so as we try to figure out weird new ways to do stuff, maybe we'll figure out some way to manipulate gravitation and levitate things. Uh, near earth in some completely unheard of way. Um, so uh, I don't know. There's a, there's an, there's an interesting future ahead and I don't see why we want to draw sure lines. Seem, we sure seem fired up by the idea. Like all of our, all of our greatest science fiction takes this as a problem that's been solved <laughs> and everyone just goes, yeah, cool. Of Hyperdrive. Course. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, warp six. <laughs> NASA has a budget for warp drive research, uh, which is warp warp drive is essentially the same thing as it's, it's a different application, but it's the same conceptual. Uh, it's the same concept as kind of levit manipulating gravitation near earth. It's manipulating, manipulating gravitation to warp space time so that you can, travel a long distance by physically making the distance shorter it's it's wild it's incredible it's absolutely fantastic in the sense of fantasy uh but it it's like mathematically it's a thing right the earth manipulates the gravitational field why can't we yeah so i guess this is part one <laughs> <laughs> of drones and weird propulsion on drones and on well, that's on quadcopter. That's what's really interesting about it, right? The quadcopter Flying itself cars. is just one configuration of some of a bunch of things that are existed, right? The wings of planes and the rotors of right. helicopters and quadcopter. It's very different, right? It, mechanically, it's different, even though it has it still has lift from a wing and still has a rotor that's spinning. But it's the propulsion. It's the it's the design behind this and the application of it. So I say we get freaky with it. Go some weird places. Word. Well, thanks for hanging out for this one. <laughs> And special thanks, as always, to our backers on Patreon who help keep 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 the quadcopter in the air, Ooh. so to speak. You should do that every um, episode. That was good. <laughs> yeah, but then eventually we're antiquated for being a quadcopter because what's the next thing? What's the repulsor drive that a space nugget Tony Stark that Elon's gonna make and dedicate to pedestrians and bike riders first? Space nugget. <laughs> that's a good news nugget we missed if you want to do it to come back in earlier 
No, let's talk about it in private. Word. Let's get out of here. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. Keep it light, everybody. Yeah.